of human bondage by w somerset maun chapter one twenty one when the hops were picked philip with the news in his pocket that he had got the appointment as assistant house physician at st luke's accompanied the athelnys back to london he took modest rooms in westminster and at the beginning of october entered upon his duties the work was interesting and varied every day he learned something new he felt himself of some consequence and he saw a good deal of sally he found life uncommonly pleasant he was free about six except on the days on which he had outpatients and then he went to the shop at which sally worked to meet her when she came out there were several young men who hung about opposite the trade entrance or a little further along at the first corner and the girls coming out two and two or in little groups nudged one another and giggled as they recognized them sally in her plain black dress looked very different from the country lass who had picked hops side by side with him she walked away from the shop quickly but she slackened her pace when they met and greeted him with her quiet smile they walked together through the busy street he talked to her of his work at the hospital and she told him what she had been doing in the shop that day he came to know the names of the girls she worked with he found that sally had a restrained but keen sense of the ridiculous and she made remarks about the girls or the men who were set over them which amused him by their unexpected drollery she had a way of saying a thing which was very characteristic quite gravely as though there were nothing funny in it at all and yet it was so sharp-sighted that philip broke into delighted laughter then she would give him a little glance in which the smiling eyes showed she was not unaware of her own humor they met with a handshake and parted as formally once philip asked her to come and have tea with him in his rooms but she refused no i won't do that it would look funny never a word of love passed between them she seemed not to desire anything more than the companionship of those walks yet philip was positive that she was glad to be with him she puzzled him as much as she had done at the beginning he did not begin to understand her conduct but the more he knew her the fonder he grew of her she was competent and self-controlled and there was a charming honesty in her you felt that you could rely upon her in every circumstance you are an awfully good sort he said to her once a propos of nothing at all i expect i'm just the same as everyone else she answered he knew that he did not love her it was a great affection that he felt for her and he liked her company it was curiously soothing and he had a feeling for her which seemed to him ridiculous to entertain towards a shop girl of nineteen he respected her and he admired her magnificent healthiness she was a splendid animal without defect and physical perfection filled him always with admiring awe she made him feel unworthy then one day about three weeks after they had come back to london as they walked together he noticed that she was unusually silent the serenity of her expression was altered by a slight line between the eyebrows it was the beginning of a frown what's the matter sally he asked she did not look at him but straight in front of her and her color darkened i don't know he understood at once what she meant his heart gave a sudden quick beat and he felt the color leave his cheeks what do you mean are you afraid that he stopped he could not go on the possibility that anything of the sort could happen had never crossed his mind then he saw that her lips were trembling and she was trying not to cry i'm not certain yet perhaps it'll be all right they walked on in silence till they came to the corner of chancery lane where he always left her she held out her hand and smiled don't worry about it yet let's hope for the best he walked away with a tumult of thoughts in his head what a fool he had been that was the first thing that struck him an abject miserable fool and he repeated it to himself a dozen times in a rush of angry feeling he despised himself how could he have got into such a mess but at the same time for his thoughts chased one another through his brain and yet seemed to stand together in a hopeless confusion like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in a nightmare he asked himself what he was going to do 
everything was so clear before him, all he had aimed at so long within reach at last, and now his inconceivable stupidity had erected this new obstacle. Philip had never been able to surmount what he acknowledged was a defect in his resolute desire for a well-ordered life, and that was his passion for living in the future, and no sooner was he settled in his work at the hospital than he had busied himself with arrangements for his travels. In the past he had often tried not to think too circumstantially of his plans for the future. It was only discouraging. But now that his goal was so near he saw no harm in giving away to a longing that was so difficult to resist. First of all he meant to go to Spain. That was the land of his heart, and by now he was imbued with its spirit, its romance and color and history and grandeur. He felt that it had a message for him in particular which no other country could give. He knew the fine old cities already as though he had trodden their tortuous streets from childhood. Cordova, Seville, Toledo, Leon, Tarragona, Burgas. The great painters of Spain were the painters of his soul, and his pulse beat quickly as he pictured his ecstasy on standing face to face with those works which were more magnificent than any others to his own tortured, restless heart. He had read the great poets more characteristic of their race than the poets of other lands, for they seemed to have drawn their inspiration not at all from the general currents of the world's literature, but directly from the torrid, scented plains and the bleak mountains of their own country. A few short months now, and he would hear with his own ears all around him the language which seemed most apt for grandeur of soul and passion. His fine taste had given him an inkling that Andalusia was too soft and sensuous, a little vulgar even, to satisfy his ardor, and his imagination dwelt more willingly among the wind-swept distances of Castile and the rugged magnificence of Aragon and Leon. He did not quite know what those unknown contacts would give him, but he felt that he would gather from them a strength and a purpose which would make him more capable of affronting and comprehending the manifold wonders of places more distant and more strange. For this was only a beginning. He had got into communication with the various companies which took surgeons out on their ships, and knew exactly what were their routes, and from men who had been on them what were the advantages and disadvantages of each line. He put aside the Orient and the P&O. It was difficult to get a berth with them and besides their passenger traffic allowed the medical officer little freedom, but there were other services which sent large tramps on leisurely expeditions to the east, stopping at all sorts of ports for various periods, from a day or two to a fortnight, so that you had plenty of time and it was often possible to make a trip inland. The pay was poor and the food no more than adequate, so that there was not much demand for the post and a man with a London degree was pretty sure to get one if he applied. Since there were no passengers other than a casual man or so, shipping on business from some out-of-the-way port to another, the life on board was friendly and pleasant. Philip knew by heart the list of places at which they touched, and each one called up in him visions of tropical sunshine and magical color and of a teeming, mysterious, intense life. Life! that was what he wanted. At last he would come to close quarters with life. And perhaps from Tokyo or Shanghai it would be possible to transship into some other line and drip down the islands of the South Pacific. A doctor was useful anywhere. There might be an opportunity to go up country in Burma, and what rich jungles in Sumatra or Borneo might he not visit. He was young still, and time was no object to him. He had no ties in England, no friends. He could go up and down the world for years, learning the beauty and the wonder and the variedness of life. Now this thing had come. He put aside the possibility that Sally was mistaken. He felt strangely certain that she was right. After all, it was so likely. Anyone could see that nature had built her to be the mother of children. He knew what he ought to do. He ought not to let the incident divert him a hair's breadth from his path. He thought of Griffiths, 
he could easily imagine with what indifference that young man would have received such a piece of news. He would have thought it an awful nuisance, and would at once have taken to his heels like a wise fellow. He would have left the girl to deal with her troubles as best she could. Philip told himself that if this had happened it was because it was inevitable. He was no more to blame than Sally. She was a girl who knew the world and the facts of life, and she had taken the risk with her eyes open. It would be madness to allow such an accident to disturb the whole pattern of his life. He was one of the few people who was acutely conscious of the transitoriness of life and how necessary it was to make the most of it. He would do what he could for Sally. He could afford to give her a sufficient sum of money. A strong man would never allow himself to be turned from his purpose. Philip said all this to himself, but he knew he could not do it. He simply could not. He knew himself. "'I'm so damned weak,' he muttered despairingly. She had trusted him and been kind to him. He simply could not do a thing which, notwithstanding all his reason, he felt was horrible. He knew he would have no peace on his travels if he had the thought constantly with him that she was wretched. Besides, there were her father and mother. They had always treated him well. It was not possible to repay them with ingratitude. The only thing was to marry Sally as quickly as possible. He would write to Dr. South, tell him he was going to be married at once, and say that if his offer still held he was willing to accept it. That sort of practice among poor people was the only one possible for him. There his deformity did not matter, and they would not sneer at the simple manners of his wife. It was curious to think of her as his wife. It gave him a queer, soft feeling, and a wave of emotion spread over him as he thought of the child which was his. He had little doubt that Dr. South would be glad to have him, and he pictured to himself the life he would lead with Sally in the fishing village. They would have a little house within sight of the sea, and he would watch the mighty ships passing to the lands he would never know. Perhaps that was the wisest thing. Cronshaw had told him that the facts of life mattered nothing to him who by the power of fancy held in fee the twin realms of space and time. It was true. Forever wilt thou love and she be fair. His wedding present to his wife would be all his high hopes. Self-sacrifice. Philip was uplifted by its beauty, and all through the evening he thought of it. He was so excited that he could not read. He seemed to be driven out of his rooms into the streets, and he walked up and down Birdcage Walk, his heart throbbing with joy. He could hardly bear his impatience. He wanted to see Sally's happiness when he made her his offer, and if it had not been so late he would have gone to her there and then. He pictured to himself the long evenings he would spend with Sally in the cozy sitting-room, the blinds undrawn so that they could watch the sea he with his books while she bent over her work, and the shaded lamp made her sweet face more fair. They would talk over the growing child, and when she turned her eyes to his there was in them the light of love, and the fishermen and their wives who were his patients would come to feel a great affection for them, and they in turn would enter into the pleasures and pains of those simple lives. But his thoughts returned to the son who would be his and hers. Already he felt in himself a passionate devotion to it. He thought of passing his hands over his little perfect limbs. He knew he would be beautiful, and he would make over to him all his dreams of a rich and varied life. And thinking over the long pilgrimage of his past, he accepted it joyfully. He accepted the deformity which had made life so hard for him. He knew that it had warped his character but now he saw also that by reason of it he had acquired that power of introspection which had given him so much delight. Without it he would never have had his keen appreciation of beauty, his passion for art and literature, and his interest in the varied spectacle of life. The ridicule and the contempt which had so often been heaped upon him had turned his mind inward and called forth those flowers which he felt would never lose their fragrance then he saw that the normal was the rarest thing in the world. 
every one had some defect of body or of mind. He thought of all the people he had known. The whole world was like a sick house, and there was no rhyme or reason in it. He saw a long procession, deformed in body and warped in mind, some with illness of the flesh, weak heart or weak lungs, and some with illness of the spirit, languor of will, or a craving for liquor. At this moment he could feel a holy compassion for them all. They were the helpless instruments of blind chance. He could pardon Griffiths for his treachery and Mildred for the pain she had caused him. They could not help themselves. The only reasonable thing was to accept the good of men and be patient with their faults. The words of the dying God crossed his memory. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. End of chapter 121 Chapter 122 he had arranged to meet Sally on Saturday in the National Gallery. She was to come there as soon as she was released from the shop and had agreed to lunch with him. Two days had passed since he had seen her, and his exultation had not left him for a moment. It was because he rejoiced in the feeling that he had not attempted to see her. He had repeated to himself exactly what he would say to her and how he should say it. Now his impatience was unbearable. He had written to Dr. South and had in his pocket a telegram from him received that morning. Sacking the mumpish fool. When will you come? Philip walked along Parliament Street. It was a fine day and there was a bright frosty sun which made the light dance in the street. It was crowded. There was a tenuous mist in the distance and it softened exquisitely the noble lines of the buildings. He crossed Trafalgar Square. Suddenly his heart gave a sort of twist in his body. He saw a woman in front of him who he thought was Mildred. She had the same figure, and she walked with that slight dragging of the feet which was so characteristic of her. Without thinking but with a beating heart he hurried till he came alongside, and then when the woman turned he saw it was someone unknown to him. It was the face of a much older person with a lined yellow skin he slackened his pace. He was infinitely relieved, but it was not only relief that he felt. It was disappointment, too. He was seized with horror of himself. Would he never be free from that passion? At the bottom of his heart, notwithstanding everything, he felt that a strange, desperate thirst for that vile woman would always linger. That love had caused him so much suffering that he knew he would never, never quite be free of it only death could finally assuage his desire. But he wrenched the pang from his heart. He thought of Sally with her kind blue eyes, and her lips unconsciously formed themselves into a smile. He walked up the steps of the National Gallery and sat down in the first room so that he should see her the moment she came in. It always comforted him to get among pictures. He looked at none in particular, but allowed the magnificence of their color, the beauty of their lines, to work upon his soul. His imagination was busy with Sally. It would be pleasant to take her away from that London in which she seemed an unusual figure, like a cornflower in a shop, among orchids and azaleas. He had learned in the Kentish hop-field that she did not belong to the town, and he was sure that she would blossom under the soft skies of Dorset to a rarer beauty. She came in, and he got up to meet her. She was in black, with white cuffs at her wrist and a lawn collar round her neck. They shook hands. "'Have you been waiting long?' "'No, ten minutes. Are you hungry?' "'Not very.' "'Let's sit here for a bit, shall we?' "'If you like.' They sat quietly, side by side, without speaking. Philip enjoyed having her near him. He was warmed by her radiant health. A glow of life seemed like an aureole to shine about her. "'Well, how have you been?' he said at last, with a little smile. "'Oh, it's all right. It was a false alarm.' "'Was it? Aren't you glad?' An extraordinary sensation filled him. He had felt certain that Sally's suspicion was well-founded. It had never occurred to him for an instant that there was a possibility of error. All his plans were suddenly overthrown, and the existence so elaborately pictured was no more than a dream which would never be realized. 
he was free once more. Free. He need give up none of his projects, and life still was in his hands for him to do what he liked with. He felt no exhilaration, but only dismay. His heart sank. The future stretched out before him in desolate emptiness. It was as though he had sailed for many years over a great waste of waters with peril and privation, and at last had come upon a fair haven, but as he was about to enter some contrary wind had arisen and drove him out again into the open sea. And because he had let his mind dwell on these soft meads and pleasant woods of the land, the vast deserts of the ocean filled him with anguish. He could not confront again the loneliness and the tempest. Sally looked at him with her clear eyes. "'Aren't you glad?' she asked again. "'I thought you'd be as pleased as Punch.' He met her gaze haggardly. "'I'm not sure,' he muttered. "'You are funny. Most men would.' He realized that he had deceived himself. It was no self-sacrifice that had driven him to think of marrying but the desire for a wife, and a home, and love. And now that it all seemed to slip through his fingers, he was seized with despair. He wanted all that more than anything in the world. What did he care for Spain and its cities, Cordova, Toledo, Leon? What to him were the pagodas of Burma and the lagoons of South Sea Islands? America was here and now, it seemed to him that all his life he had followed the ideals that other people, by their words or their writings, had instilled into him, and never the desires of his own heart. Always his course had been swayed by what he thought he should do, and never by what he wanted with his whole soul to do. He put all that aside now with a gesture of impatience. He had always lived in the future, and the present always had slipped through his fingers his ideals? He thought of his desire to make a design, intricate and beautiful, out of the myriad meaningless facts of life. Had he not seen also that the simplest pattern, that in which a man was born, worked, married, had children and died, was likewise the most perfect? It might be that to surrender to happiness was to accept defeat, but it was a defeat better than many victories. He glanced quickly at Sally. He wondered what she was thinking, and then looked away again. "'I was going to ask you to marry me,' he said. "'I thought perhaps you might, but I shouldn't have liked to stand in your way. You wouldn't have done that. How about your travels, Spain and all that? How do you know I want to travel? I ought to know something about it. I've heard you and Dad talk about it till you were blue in the face.' I don't care a damn about all that." He paused for an instant, and then spoke in a low, hoarse whisper. "'I don't want to leave you. I can't leave you.' She did not answer. He could not tell what she thought. "'I wonder if you'll marry me, Sally.' She did not move, and there was no flicker of emotion on her face. But she did not look at him when she answered. "'If you like. Don't you want to?' Oh, of course I'd like to have a house of my own, and it's about time I was settling down." She smiled a little. He knew her pretty well by now, and her manner did not surprise him. But don't you want to marry me? There's no one else I would marry. Then that settles it. Mother and Dad will be surprised, won't they? I'm so happy. I want my lunch, she said. Dear. He smiled and took her hand and pressed it. They got up and walked out of the gallery. They stood for a moment at the balustrade and looked at Trafalgar Square. Cabs and omnibuses hurried to and fro, and crowds passed, hastening in every direction, and the sun was shining. This is the end of Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Recording.